Did you bring a Bible this morning? Praise God. I would like for you to turn with me to the second epistle to the Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 4. That's our text today. Second Corinthians chapter 4. While you're turning there, I want to tell you about one of the most remarkable archaeological discoveries ever made. <clears throat> 1946, uh, a couple of Bedouin goat herders, uh, one young man and his cousin were actually looking for a lost goat. They were in an area uh, around a very rocky crag about a mile from the Dead Sea, a uh, very barren part of Israel. What? what is now Israel, it wasn't Israel, Israel wasn't a nation at that time, 1946. Uh, but just about a mile or so from the Dead Sea, and uh, one of these young Bedouin shepherds saw a hole. It was a cave. And uh, thinking that maybe his goat fell in there, or maybe had wandered in there, he took a rock and threw it into the cave, to see if he could scare the goat out or run it out or if he hit the goat and heard it yell or whatever. So he threw the, the rock in the cave and he didn't hit the goat, but he did hit something. In fact, he heard something break in that hole, something crash and break. And he decided he would investigate. So he and his cousin climbed into that hole and they found some very, very old earthenware jars and he had actually broken one of them with this rock these jars were ancient and protruding from the broken jar was an ancient scroll he took that scroll uh, and began looking in this little small cave and actually found several other jars and seven scrolls Seven ancient scrolls came out of that little cave. Uh, well, he took them home, hung them out, showed them to his friends and, you know, relatives. They were kind of a curiosity. Somebody told him, look, you know, those things are probably valuable. Maybe you ought to look into selling them. You might be able to get a little money for them. He wound up selling a few of them. I think he sold two or three of them for about $30. Uh, and over a period of a year or so, somebody saw one of those scrolls and realized what it was. Just how old it was and what a rare treasure it was. And to make a very long story short, in 1947 and 1948, uh, they began searching those caves where those scrolls were found. And they found six caves in there and almost a thousand scrolls of almost a thousand it was like 950 or 970 something like that scrolls or fragments of scrolls that today we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, one of those scrolls was the ancient Isaiah scroll that dates it's been carbon dated four times since its discovery it's the entire book of Isaiah on one huge scroll it, it's been carbon dated four times and dates all the way back to 100 to 300 B.C. Up, up to 300 years before Christ. That's how old this scroll is. It's uh, a precious discovery of uh, ancient texts, biblical texts, and other literature as well. Not everything they found in there was Bible texts, but they found all kinds of literature in there and so forth. But this discovery has been acknowledged to be one of the rarest archaeological treasures in human history, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Isn't it interesting that these precious scrolls were found in clay jars? Just common, ordinary clay jars, which I've come to learn was not unusual for treasure valuable treasure to be buried 
in clay jars. That was uh, often the case in ancient times. In fact, uh, many of the Oriental kings buried money in clay uh, jars, like gold coins or silver coins or precious jewels. They would they would put them in these clay jars. They would seal the tops and they would bury them. Uh, you know, they didn't really have banks in those days, so they buried uh, their wealth, their treasures, and so forth. Treasure, vast, untold, incalculable treasures in clay jars. Even the book of Isaiah speaks of a passage, Isaiah chapter 32. You don't have to turn there, but in verse 14, Isaiah wrote a scroll. You know, I, uh, not Isaiah, Jeremiah. Did I say Isaiah? Yeah. It's actually Jeremiah 32 and verse 14. Jeremiah bought a, a piece of land before the Babylonians destroyed, uh, came in and destroyed uh, everything. Jeremiah bought a piece of land. He said, I want you to write the deed on a scroll, and then I want you to take that scroll and put it in a clay jar. That way it would lay up for many days, he said. It would lay up for many days and be safe. Treasure in clay jars. Well, our text today is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse 7, where the Bible says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, in clay jars. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in jars of clay, in earthen jars. We have this treasure. What treasure? What treasure is he talking about? What treasure do we have? And I'm glad you asked that question. Because the answer is actually uh, our message today, and the answer is in the context. You know, whenever you want to know what a verse means, read it in its context. Just read the verses before it, the verses after it. Read it in the context of the chapter. Read it in the context of the whole book. And then, of course, you understand it in the context of all of the Bible and all of theology. But the answer, what treasure do we have? Paul says we have this treasure. What treasure? Good question. Let's see what he's talking about. Because we have it in earthen jars. We have it in a clay jar. Verse 1, look with me, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, we're going to read the context. He says, therefore seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We have this ministry. Really? We have this ministry. What ministry is that? Well, really to understand that, you'd have to look a little bit into chapter 3. And since I'm not going to take the time to read all of chapter 3, uh, Here's what I would like to point out. Paul, in chapter 3, is making some contrasts between the law and the preaching of Moses and grace and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that this is a contrast. He said there's plenty of people preaching Moses, that is, preaching the law, going back to the dietary restrictions of Moses, Sabbath-keeping, circumcision, all the laws, the rituals, the rites, the holy days, the Sabbath-keeping, so on and so forth. He says, there is that ministry, and then there is this ministry. The ministry of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ministry of salvation by grace through faith. So, he's insisting in chapter 3 that the law and the gospel are separate entities. For instance, chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, the law was written on tables of stone. But he goes on and says, but the gospel of the Spirit was written on tables, the fleshly tables of our heart. In chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, We are ministers of the New Testament because the letter kills, the letter being the law, the legalistic law that every Jew was obligated to keep, and if they didn't keep it, they perished under divine penalty. He says, The letter kills, but we are of the Spirit, that is, New Testament, Gospel, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, and the Spirit, he says, gives life. In chapter 3 and verse 7, he called the law the ministration of death. Now that's some powerful language. The law, going back to the law, keeping the law, law keeping, ministers death. It's the ministry of death. But the gospel, he says, is the ministry of life. 
the ministry of life. Verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11. The law, while it was glorious in its time, was done away with, while the gospel of the Spirit is far more glorious, and it remains to this day. So Paul, when you begin reading in chapter 4, in verse 1, he says, This, wherefore, seeing that we have this ministry, this ministry of the gospel, this ministry of the Spirit of God, this, this is what we have, this life-giving gospel. And uh, seeing, he says in verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, that we've received it by the mercies of God, we do not faint, we do not quit, we do not give up. We do not become discouraged. We do not lose heart. It doesn't matter if people don't receive it. It doesn't matter if people spit in our face. It doesn't matter if the, the way we go is, is a, a difficult road or we face many trials. Here's what he says. This is our ministry. This is what God called me to preach. The gospel, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, the gospel of salvation by faith. This, and he says... And we do not faint. We won't quit. We won't give up. No matter who follows or, or who rejects us. He says in verse 2, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. There are people who do that, you know. They deceitfully handle the Word of God. They twist and distort what the Bible says to fit their own ends or their own agenda. He says, But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I want to read this verse to you in the Williams translation. Williams translates verse 2, On the other hand, I have renounced all underhanded, disgraceful methods. I wish preachers today would do that. I've renounced all underhanded, disgraceful methods. I neither practice cunning, nor do I tamper with God's message. But by clear and candid statements of truth, I try to commend myself to every human conscience in God's sight. If you allow me to paraphrase a little bit of what Paul's saying here. He says, we just speak honestly and truthfully and plainly the Word of God. And the Spirit of God bears witness in your conscience that it is the truth, that what we tell you is the truth. You're, you know in your spirit that it's, that it's so. You know that we're telling you the truth. You know that we're sincere. That's what Paul is saying. And then he says in verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, the word hid means to cover up, to obscure, it means to veil, to cover with a veil, uh, you know, or, or to hinder in some way. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Literally, it is, it, is, it is hidden to those who are perishing. If our gospel be veiled. Now this too, to fully grasp what Paul is referring to, it does refer back to chapter 3, where uh, in chapter 3, in fact, in chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says this. He says, Not as Moses that put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. You remember when uh, Moses came down from the mountain, Exodus chapter 34, his face shone with the glory of God. I mean, he had been in the presence of the Almighty. And when he came from that mountain, his face shone with such a brightness that it so thoroughly convicted everybody there that they asked him to cover his face. We're so frightened by your appearance. Cover your face. We are so convicted. And so... Moses actually veiled his face. That's what the Bible tells us in Exodus 34. I mean, his countenance was just so transformed. The point here, and this is a very, very significant point that is made in chapter 3. He says in chapter 3, verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. He says, but even until this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. But 
When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, I, I, here's my point. Here's the point that Paul is making, and I, and I want us to grasp this. Moses veiled his face because it shined with the glory of God. But that glory only shined from his face temporarily. The glory faded. But because his face was veiled, they didn't see it fade. All they knew is that it shone and it was glorious and it was scary and they acknowledged it was the, the, the power of God all over him. So he veiled his face so they wouldn't be frightened. And you know, when the glory faded, they didn't notice that. His face was still veiled. Now, he didn't keep his face veiled all the time, but, but it took a little while for the glory to subside. And here is Paul's message. He says Moses was actually a very figure and type of the Old Testament dispensation. It was glorious. That's what he just said here. It was a glorious dispensation. They had the law. They had the prophets. They had the priests. They had the sacrifices. They had the tabernacle. They had the temple. They had the altar. It was glorious. But it faded. It was a fading glory. It faded. It's no longer applicable to the Christian. No part of it, no aspect of it. It was a fading glory. To this day, the Jews don't see it. He says their minds are still blinded. They're still blinded. They don't see the glory of Christ. Their eyes are veiled. They didn't see the glory of the Old Testament fade. So they still follow it. They're still bound by their works, by their rituals, by their Sabbath keeping, by their feast days and circumcision and dietary restrictions and millennia of laws, rules, regulations and so forth. They did not see, their eyes were blinded, they didn't see the glory fade. But that's not where Paul stops. He says in chapter 4 and verse 3, if our gospel is hidden, he uses the same word, the veil. If there's a veil on the gospel where people are not seeing what we're preaching. See, the Jews didn't see the glory of Moses fade. They didn't realize the Old Testament has no bearing on the New Testament believer. Not that, it's in that, that, not that it has no value, no worth, or no merit, because we know the new is based on the old. But we cannot try to resurrect a glory that's gone from the old covenant by keeping it, by holding on to any aspect of it for our salvation. Amen. We must see the glory that is Christ Jesus and the glory that is salvation by grace through faith. There is no salvation any other way. He goes on. He says, If our gospel is hid, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, it is hidden to those that are the perishing, that are the lost. And I want you to think about what he is saying. It is hidden to those who are willfully blind. It is hidden to the willfully blind. Those who do not see, not because God has obscured their vision, but sin has obscured their vision. Sin has obscured their vision. It's because they don't want to see. You know why people won't listen to you when you tell them about Christ? They do not want to see. No, no, they don't. They are bound by sin. They are bound by falsehood. They are bound by false religion, false philosophies. And what you say, there's a glory to what you say. There is a conviction to what you say. Because you're pointing out the gospel. The Word of God. You point that out to them and they don't want to see it. It means they have to change their life. It means they're going to have to repent of this lifestyle they've led, this selfishness, this materialism, this ungodly fornication, drunken, drug addict, addicted, carrying on. And they like their sins. John chapter 3 and verse 19 is one of the most serious indictments in all of Scripture. This is the condemnation. That light has come into the world 
and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Light has come, but men love the dark. They love the dark. Paul says, those who don't see, they don't see the gospel, their eyes are veiled, they put the veil there themselves. They are willfully blind. The Jews didn't want to see Moses' face because it was too convicting, and today people don't want to see Jesus' face because it is too convicting. It's too convicting. Actually, there's more than one element at work here. Men don't want to see. That's one element. They love their sins. Just as the Jews didn't want to see the glory of Moses' face, people today don't want to see the glories of Jesus Christ. Amen. But the second element is revealed in the very next verse. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, he says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan is referred to here as the God, small g, the God of this world. And he is a blinder. He is a blinder. That's what he does. He is a blinder of men's eyes, men's hearts, men's minds. Uh, and, and through his working and the working of all of his uh, fallen angels and his other agents of deception, he blinds the hearts of the multitudes into unbelief and scorn, and he keeps mankind through blindness. He keeps mankind in sin. And blind, the word blinded, he blinds them. It means exactly that. It means to be blind, to, to lack vision, to lack sight. Just like the Philistines blinded Samson, they bore his eyes out, the Bible. They bored his eyes out so he could not see. Well, the devil bores men's spiritual sight out so that they do not see. And again, when we love sin, we love the dark, God will give us darkness. When we love not the truth, Remember, he says he'll send them a lie. Yeah. You love the dark, God will keep you in the dark. Amen. But multitudes today are kept spiritually blind, deceived by the devil, blinded by the devil, in unbelief, in skepticism. Uh, you know, the devil's quick to provide excuses for you to not believe. Right. He can provide you with a million excuses why you shouldn't believe. Amen. And if you're looking for... Uh, reasons to, to not believe on Christ, He'll provide you with many of them. But they all come back to catering to our fleshly wants and desires. You know, the, the problem is, man loves sin, they love the dark, and we will gravitate towards a message that goes along with what we want to hear. And we don't want to hear that there's a God we're accountable to who will bring us one day before Him where we will stand and give an account for our lives and what we've done. Uh, Augustine, all the way back in the early centuries of Christianity, made this statement. Blindness of heart is a sin and a punishment for sin and a cause of sin. And that's exactly right. Blindness of heart is a sin. And it's a punishment of sin. And it's a cause of sin. All you have to do is look around the, our own country and see the spiritual climate of America. I mean, the apathy, the spiritual indifference, the disinterest, the outright mockery and ridicule of a, a Christian faith, the aversion to Christian things. Not a complete aversion to spiritual things. Spiritual, you know, yeah. big wide word, spiritual. I'm a spiritual person. I mean, I don't believe in Christianity, but I'm a spiritual person. What do you believe in? Crystals and reincarnation. I'm a very spiritual person. Yeah. But not a Christian. Right. But you look around at the spiritual climate in America, 
and I'll tell you what you see. You see the work of the devil in blinding the eyes and the hearts of multitudes. Blind. Blind to the truth. How can they be so blind? Well, they want to be blind for one thing. They want to be blind. And the devil caters to that desire because he is and his minions are the rulers of the darkness of this world and they will keep mankind bound and blind and shackled. Verse 4, lest, verse 4 says, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. <coughs> lest the gospel light should shine into their hearts and minds. Satan is very good at ministering unbelief. The light of Christ shines and it breaks bondages and liberates. And that's the grace we've received. Verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Praise God, the light shined in our hearts. The gospel message shined in our hearts. The revelation of Jesus Christ shined in our hearts. And we see, no longer blind, no longer bound, no longer veiled, we see. We see that Christ is all that the Bible says He is, the way, the truth, and the life. And apart from Him, there is no salvation. There is no other way to glory. Amen. We see, we see that salvation is not by our good works. Our works cannot earn us one step towards heaven. But Christ's righteousness, His righteous life was accepted as a sacrifice in our stead. And now by faith in Him, by faith in Him, and only by faith in Him are we saved. And then that faith always, always transforms the life. A life transformed. The light of Christ has shined. And despite all of the devil's efforts to keep us blind, the light has shined through. And we see. Amen. Our eyes have been opened. We see the beauty of Christ. We see the beauty of the cross. We see the knowledge of the Savior. We see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is our treasure. We have this treasure, he says, verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. This is our treasure. Far beyond any earthly wealth. This, he says, verse 7, we have this treasure, this treasure, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And if you look back up with me to verse 1, he says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, this ministry, this, this ministry. The word ministry there, deaconia is where we get our word deacon. It means to serve. We have this service. This is our office. This is our duty, our privilege, our responsibility. This is what we are called out to do. That is the ministry of the gospel. Not just Paul either. Now Paul had a, had a ministry of the gospel, but guess what? So do we. So do you. So do I. That's the great commission. That's the call of every disciple, you and me. Amen. We have this ministry. This ministry. I, w I want you to consider a couple of things this morning. It is the greatest treasure in the world. There is no treasure greater. None more valuable. None more precious. It is the greatest treasure in the world. It has been placed into our hearts. It has been placed into our hands to convey to others. Now that's a serious trust and a serious responsibility. The greatest treasure in the world 
has been placed into your hands to convey to convey and that's especially astonishing when you consider verse 7 says we are all earthen vessels we're just jars of clay and you know what that's all we are that's all we are is a jar of clay made of the dust of the earth we are jars of clay just like those earthen vessels that held those precious Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, a treasure more valuable than money can, can count. We are earthen vessels, clay, made of the clay of the earth. We are not heavenly vessels. We are not even gold or silver vessels. <laughs> we are not even gilded vessels, you know, that just have a silver plate on them. <laughs> We're just earthen vessels, that's all just made of the dust of the earth and you know what that means you know what an earthen vessel is fragile brittle weak common common I want to make a few quick points this morning that I would like for you to take to heart about this verse Point number one is that we are all earthen vessels, every single one of us. Earthen vessels, clay jars. There's a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20 says, In a great house, you know, a great house, that would be like a mansion or a palace, in a very rich person's house. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. So a person who is very wealthy, they've got all kind of vessels in their house. They've got the real gold, the real silver, then they might have the gold plate or the silver plate, but they're also going to have some wooden vessels and clay vessels and so forth. Well, according to the Bible, we're not the gold vessels. We're not even the gilded vessels or the wooden vessels. We are clay. We are the earthen vessels. Now, you know what that means? It's not the good stuff. It's not the stuff that the rich people put on display when their guests are coming over and they want to impress them. You know, let me take out. It's not even the fine china that we might take out. And, and how fine is our fine china, really? Because we bought it at Walmart, you know. But, <laughs> but, you know, you've got guests coming over, you want to clean up the house, you put the nice stuff on display. Well, we're not the nice stuff. This, I mention this so we don't get too puffed up in ourselves, you know. We don't think, hey, I'm a gold jaw, pal. You're not even gold plated. You, you made out of dirt. How proud should we be? You don't put the clay vessels out to impress people. We are all earthen vessels. Let's remember that. Every one of us, earthen vessels. It doesn't matter how rich a person is. It doesn't matter how important, prestigious, how much. It, it doesn't matter. Every human being is just clay. That's all. And you and I, as members of the body of Christ, we're all just clay vessels. But that brings me to a second point that I want to make this morning. While we are earthen vessels... Yet we are chosen vessels. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 15, God spoke to a disciple named Ananias. Now this is not the same Ananias that was struck dead, you know, in Acts chapter 5. Obviously this is Acts chapter 9, this guy is still around. So There were many people in the Bible who had, you know, the same names. But a disciple of Christ named Ananias, uh, well, an angel appeared to him in a vision and said, I want, I'm going to send you to a, a house. I want you to go there and pray for a man named Saul of Tarsus. He's there waiting for you to come pray for him. And this man says, oh, I heard of that guy. <laughs> now, now, he's got a, a vision here. This is a divine revelation, a, a, angelic appearance. And he says, wait, I heard of that guy. 
That's a bad man. That's an evil man. I have heard of all the terrible things that man has done to your disciples. Uh, and this is what this is what the vision said. You go do what I said. You go over there. You go pray for him. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. He is a chosen vessel. Nothing but clay, but I've chosen him. And I've chosen him to do a work for me. Amen. And I want to tell you that every single one of you here has been chosen. You have been chosen. You may just be an earthen vessel, but you are a chosen vessel. The Lord has put his, he has put his name on you. He has written his name so that you belong to him. You are chosen by him. To know Him, to serve Him, to honor Him, to trust Him, Amen. to live for Him, to glorify Him, to honor Him. You are a chosen vessel. Despite all of Saul's flaws, now let me tell you, Saul, for all of his education, this was a flawed human being. This was a man to whom cruelty came easy. This was a man who had no trouble throwing Christians into prison and beating them and even seeing to it that they were executed. He didn't care, young or old. He didn't care if a mother was dragged off, dragged off in front of her child. This was a man that had a lot of flaws. This was a man that most people would be terrified of. This was not a man I would choose. Nor would you. But then I guess if I was choosing, I wouldn't have chose me either. Or you. Definitely not Bob. <laughs> but you know, God in His infinite mercies and graces, He chose you. There are billions of people on planet Earth. Billions. Seven billion, I think, the last, the last count. God reached through a sea of humanity and put His finger on you to make Himself known to you, to remove the veil from your eyes and reveal Christ to you. What a gift. Amen. What a precious treasure. Christ revealed to you. You are an earthen vessel. You are a chosen vessel. The Lord said, He's a chosen vessel unto me. Chosen. You've been chosen also to bear this treasure, this treasure of the gospel of Christ. You have been chosen to serve the Lord Christ. You have been chosen to represent Him on this earth. You have been chosen to do your part in working towards his kingdom. You have been chosen like Paul to shine, to let the gospel shine through you. In a sin-darkened world, you've been chosen to shine. Verse 6, that same light that shined in our hearts, guess what? We're supposed to relay that. We're supposed to convey that. You were chosen to shine. So, so you are an earthen vessel. You are a chosen vessel. We hold a great treasure, the gospel message of the Lord Jesus Christ. That brings me to my third point today. We do not originate the treasure. We do not originate it. We don't make it up. We dare not alter it. It is not our treasure. It is the Master's treasure. Amen. We are only a vessel. We only convey the treasure. And when we convey it, we convey all of the treasure. Amen. We don't leave any part of it out. Yeah. We don't convey only the parts we like. Amen. We don't take an eraser to the gospel no. to remove parts that some might find offensive. Amen. You're right. We convey the Master's treasure. The treasure's not ours. The treasure's entrusted to us. We don't originate it. Don't make up some stupidity on your own. 
You convey the gospel. That's the treasure. It's not ours to alter, to modify, to change, to soften, to make more palatable to carnal people. It's not ours. It's not ours to modify. Hello. Amen. And that brings me to yet a fourth point. We do not convey ourselves to others. Ours is not the ministry of self-promotion. Chapter 4, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. We don't preach ourselves. We don't convey ourselves. We're not out to impress others with us. We don't make followers of us. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And we, what are we? We're just your servants. That's all. Your servants. For Jesus' sake. You know, the bottom line is, it's not the vessel that a dying man needs. It's the contents. It's the contents. We're just the water bottle. We're just the bottle. Christ is the water. Right? We're just the medicine bottle. Christ is the medicine that heals the world's ills. We're... We're just messengers. Christ is the message. And that brings me to my fifth point. This is both a danger and a very sober fact that I would like for us to consider. Sometimes the contents can sometimes pick up the taste of the vessel. Sometimes the contents can pick up the taste of the vessel. You drink a Coke sometimes, it tastes like a tin can. Sometimes you drink water out of the bottle, and it tastes more plastic than anything else. Have you ever drank water out of a hose? I mean, that's the way we always drank when we were kids. I don't think I'd do it today. I don't think of what I see what a hose looks like down in there. But in those days, we ate everything, you know, and nothing bothered us. Because we didn't know. Now you know. Now your mind will make you sick just thinking about it, you know. But you drank out of a rubber hose, and what did you taste? Rubber. Mold, maybe. Sometimes, sometimes the contents can pick up the taste of the vessel. And that's what we want to avoid. We don't want the contents. Well, the fact of the matter remains is that the contents must change the vessel, not the vessel change the contents. People need to see and hear less of us and more of Christ. So so the promotion must not be of ourselves, but the promotion must be of Christ. We could say, why would God in all of his infinite wisdom choose to house the world's most precious treasure in an earthen vessel? When he could have sent angels, you know. He could have sent angels to preach the gospel. He could have sent angels to pastor churches. But instead, he chose earthen vessels. Earthen vessels. You have this, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And and here's his answer to that question. Verse 7, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The excellency means the superabundance. It's actually the Greek word hyperbole, which Thea defines as something beyond all measure, beyond all measure, exceeding measure, superabundance, that the excellency of the power may be of God, it can be seen to be of God and and not from us. The International Standard Version translates this verse, but we have this treasure in clay jars to show that its extraordinary power comes from God. And not from us. 
This way all glory and honor and praise goes to the treasure that's within us and not to the clay jar that merely conveys it. Uh, There's one other thing perhaps that we should mention this morning and I know you've probably heard it mentioned before. We are all earthen vessels, chosen vessels. We're to convey the treasure, not in any way modify it. There is a very real sense in every one of us that it, 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 in which every one of us is not only an earthen vessel, but even a cracked vessel. Uh, because none of us are perfect. Amen. You're right. All of us are a little bit cracked. Well, some a lot more than others. You know. I'm not going to look at anybody, you know, but. <laughs> God does use clay vessels, and He even will use a cracked vessel. Now, it simply means that if God did not choose to use the imperfect, He wouldn't use any of us. Because none of us are perfect. That's right. We're all a little bit cracked. <laughs> <laughs> I read a, a story some time ago. It's a very common story. Uh, it's been told through the ages. Some places, uh, in some ways it's placed in India. Sometimes it's placed in China. But the story remains the same about a peasant woman who used to carry water every day uh, from a spring back to her hut. She had to walk a trail every day. She had two clay jars. They hung on a pole. The pole was around her neck. And you've seen pictures like this or, or drawings of it through the years where, where these peasant women would carry these jars all the way down to the stream, fill up their clay pots, and then carry those full jars all the way back to their village. Well, in this story, it's an, it's an old, old legend one of those jars was cracked and it leaked but it's the only jars the peasant woman had so she would go down and fill the jars up and and as she would walk back with the full jars by the time she got back to her house one of the jars was always half half gone because it leaked along the way and in the legend one day the jar spoke to her the clay jar said I'm not a good jar I'm broken and I see your disappointment every time you get back to the house because half of my contents are gone. And if I were you, I'd just get rid of me and try to find a better jar. And the old woman said, well, you don't understand at all, do you? She said, do you notice the beautiful flowers on the trail that grow only on one side of the trail? She said, I planted those seeds there years ago. And when I carry you back on my shoulder, you water them every day on the way back. And because you water those seeds, they have grown into beautiful flowers. And I have used those flowers every day to decorate my table. So the clay vessel was a very useful vessel and produced a beautiful thing. You know, the fact of the matter is, while that is just the stuff of legend, the fact is God uses clay vessels that are a little cracked uh, there's not a single person in the Bible yeah there's not a single person in the Bible that was perfect that God used Abraham you know had the he telling everybody oh that's my sister Sarah laughing at the promise wait me old lady I'm gonna have a son you know uh, or Moses, Moses disobeying God and striking the rock the second time instead of speaking to the rock. Or David, David, a man after God's own heart. But look what he did with Bathsheba and her husband and so forth. I mean, even Peter, the great man of God, even Peter denied the Lord. Cracked vessels one and all. And yet, and yet through repentance and faith, you know, God will use us despite our flaws. God used them anyway. He used them anyway. That's the point I would make. Paul said, really, it's not many wise or noble or mighty that's called. But 
God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He's, conf he's chosen the weak things to confound the mighty. He's chosen the base things and the things that are despised has he chosen. In fact, he says he's chosen the things that are not to confound the things that are. Amen. You know, all the great and mighty and wise and he's chosen the clay, the clay. Earthen vessels. I like to read uh, biographies and stories about some of the men and women that God has used mightily. And uh, one of my favorites is a man named D.L. Moody uh, that God used mightily. He is a man that was overweight, had a third grade education, third grade education, never attended seminary never was ordained by any religious body. And everybody who ever heard him said he slaughtered the English language. Well, you know, third grade education. But this clay vessel, for all of his cracks, shook two continents for Christ. Just a clay vessel. Just like you. In each of us is a precious treasure. In each and every one of us, the gospel of Christ has shined and abides and resides. And we have the privilege of carrying this treasure. You know, sometimes the light only shines when there's a little crack for it to shine through. <laughs> We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The torches in Gideon's 300 hidden inside a clay vessel, those vessels had to be cracked for the torch to be seen. The alabaster box had to be broken for the fragrance to be released. God will use clay vessels. He'll even use a cracked vessel. You don't have to be perfect to be used by God. You have to be willing. You have to be surrendered. Yes. You do have to be repentant. Amen. Amen. Yes. You're right. You know, when the angel appeared to Gideon the angel appeared to him and said Gideon thou mighty man of valor you know where Gideon was he was hiding he was hiding from the Midianites trying to thrash a little bit of wheat he had to hide because the Midianites if they found him they'd take all of his food so he was hiding trying to scrape a little food by he said you mighty man of valor he said, I'm going to use you to go deliver Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon says, wait, you got the wrong guy. He said, my tribe, we're the weakest tribe in all of Israel. And my family, we're the weakest and poorest family in, in all our tribe. And me and my family, I'm the run of the litter. You got the wrong guy. And, and I guess you could paraphrase there and say, well... That's exactly why I'm choosing you. Because when I deliver Israel through your hands, everybody will know that it was God and not you. <laughs> That's absolutely right. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So when you share your faith, when you pray for the sick, it's not you. No glory goes to you. All glory goes to the excellency of the power that God has chosen to house in a clay pot. You and me. A crack pot. Father, I pray tonight that you'd stir our hearts. Stir, stir each of our hearts, Lord, with the revelation that we are earthen vessels, and yes, we are flawed vessels, but we are chosen vessels. Chosen to bear the greatest treasure on earth, 
and to convey this treasure to others. Lord, let them see the light of Christ through us. And Lord, I pray that none of the contents would be affected by the vessel. But let the vessel be transformed by the contents. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Praise God.